Good morning, church family. It's good to be here with you today again. Please join me as we sing Jesus Messiah. Church. My name is Mike LeClaire and I'm the pastor of this church. And I hope all is well with you, regardless of the day or the hour that we live in. I hope you're excited about the opportunities that God has put before you. And I think we're going to have an opportunity to really let the light of Christ shine during these times. Before we move on, I, I want to be, uh, I want to let you know that every morning, Sally and I pray for, for our church. We pray for you. It looks something like this. We get up, we start with worship, we go from worship, and we begin to pray for each of the ministries and the people that we know are in the leadership of those ministries and the people who work in those ministries. And then we begin to know people, we know people by name and we begin to pray for people by name. And then there's those faces that we see, but we don't know the names attached to the faces. We pray for those faces and God knows who they are as they come to our minds. So know that you're being lifted up and prayed for. And uh, my call and my charge to you is to do the same for us. 
and others that God lays on your heart to pray for. So we are talking about Christ's suffering for us today. It is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, do you know what that is? Palm Sunday, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We get excited about Palm Sunday. And we should be excited about Palm Sunday. But we should know more and respond more to the King of Kings than what they did in Jerusalem at this time. Let me tell you and set a little backdrop before we move on. Um, I'm going to read the primary scriptures for this. And it's going to be Mark 14, 32 through 36. It's just kind of the, the meat that I'm going to focus on today. So before I get into the backdrop and the, the, the actual message, I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the word. So Mark 14, 32 says, Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him and began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther, and he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all these things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you will. So Heavenly Father, we just pray right now that by your spirit, speak the words to this vessel you need to speak. Let me not get in your way. Open all of our ears, our hearts, our minds, souls, and spirit to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The backdrop to the Easter week goes back 700 years. There's many prophecies that speak about different components within this whole Holy Week story that we've grown to know and love. But in this particular story, <clears throat> and we're talking on Palm Sunday, there's a prophecy given by the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah 9.9. 9, and it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, this was a prophecy given a couple hundred years before the actual event took place in Jesus' day. So why did Jesus have a prophecy about this event in this day? To establish that he was the one that the word of God and the prophecy spoke about. And he was the one that was going to lay his life down on the line for all of us. Why did he do this? Well, in Mark 10, 33, we get a picture of his purpose. And I'll give his purpose, then I'll give the why, I believe at least, why he did this. In Mark 10, 33, it says, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest, to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. The whole of the Holy Week is summed up in that scripture in my eye. So why did he come? Luke 19, 41, A says, now, as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. What does that mean? He saw the city and he wept over it. It means he loved her. He loved the city of Jerusalem. He loved the Jews, the people of Jerusalem. And he loves you and he loves me. Everything he did during this week was for you, for me, and it was for the Jew. Wow. There's an incredible amount of love here. We'll just see how incredible that love was. Unbelievable love, okay? Mark 12 is the reality of what we read in Zechariah. So we'll just go past that. And we're going to get to the last thing. So as Jesus is coming into town, the people are excited. And they're yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Hosanna means save now. And <clears throat> the people were excited about this king of the Jews, if you will, coming in to Jerusalem to save them. Not their souls as much as to save them from Rome. It was a political king that they were looking for and that they were excited about coming. But he is no political king. He is a king, but he is the king of kings. And so when they shout, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they're understanding 
is shallow. Their worship, their praise, their adoration is shallow. It's like a being at a football game and your team is stinking the place up. It's shallow like that. You don't celebrate it anymore. No, he's not like that. So what happened? He comes into town and people begin to take their cloaks, <coughs> branches and coats and palm branches and all these things and lay them at the feet of this this donkey, this colt, this foal, whatever it's called, of a, of a colt, full of a colt that he's riding in on, never been ridden on before. And it all fulfills prophecy as he does this. And they begin to chant these things and receive these things as he comes in. So he goes from there, which is on a Sunday, and he moves to a Thursday, and he's spending time with his disciples. And he meets in the upper room at the time of the Last Supper. And you all recall a lot of the stories within the Last Supper, but just what is taking place there is one of his final teachings and his final charge because he knows what's coming. And he speaks to his disciples those final things. What's he telling them? He's teaching them to be a servant. Serve. Don't be Lord. Be a servant. <clears throat> and he demonstrates that by the washing of their feet. He spots out the betrayer, Judas. And he tells him to go do what he came to do. And there was some betrayal going on and he called it out. He has communion. So he's with the brothers, the, the disciples. And they have a time of communion. We're going to do that Sunday. We're going to do that Sunday as a church. Next next Sunday, you're going to have bread. And you're going to have juice or whatever you use to represent the wine. And we'll take communion together. Apart, but together in spirit. And he's together with his disciples. And they take communion. It's beautiful. And then he's on his way to Gethsemane. But before he does, there's a prayer. And I want to read this prayer to you. It's a bit long, but it's so incredibly powerful. In John 17, 1, this is Jesus praying to the Father for himself. And then he moves from that to praying for his disciples. And then he goes from there to praying for you and me. It's an intimate and deep prayer. And I just want you to listen to this as I read it to you. So in John 17, 1, Jesus spoke these words and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may be glorifying you. As you have given him authority over flesh that he should give you eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the one, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now he moves to praying for his disciples. And he says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they have known all things which you have given me which you have given me are from you. For I have given them the words which you have given me and they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you and that they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours and all mine are yours and yours are mine and I am glorified in them. Now I, <clears throat> now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I have come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be as one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now... I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. 
They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As I sent, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify, sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified by the truth. And then he prays for you and me, all believers. And he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you have loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. And what we hear here is such a beautiful harmony and a joining together of the Father to the Son. The Spirit is always present in that. And then the Son to us and us to the Father that we are united. We are the bride of Christ coming together and he is praying for you and for me at this time. And where does he go from there? He's heading to the garden. He's moving with his group over the Kidron Valley into this place called um, the Garden of Gethsemane. And that word Gethsemane is significant because it has a meeting. The, the, <clears throat> the garden is really an orchard, you know, and the orchard is really one of olive trees, old ancient olive trees. And what would happen is people would pick the olives, they'd put them in the vat and they would, they would squeeze and put them in the press and it would squeeze the oil out of the olive. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen to Jesus in the garden. And it, it looks like what we read earlier at the beginning. In verse 33, it says, He began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And then in verse 34, it says, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. What is happening with Jesus? He moves from um, the palms and the celebration and the hosannas to the deep, intimate time with his disciples in the upper room. And he goes from there after communion and has this incredibly intimate prayer with God about him and God, the apostles and God, and us and God, and, and how rich and deep it was. And now he moves to the garden because now everything begins to turn in terms of the intimacy. It comes into the reality of how we get to this place. What am I talking about? I'm talking about this. When he says um, that he began to be troubled and deeply distressed, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. He is going through a process where he's beginning to take on the sin of the world. The past sins, the future sins, and the sins that are happening at the moment. Past, present, future. He who knew no sin, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. What does that mean? That means that the sin that you and I carry, the stuff that overwhelms us that we can't even deal with, we hide it away, we don't confess it sometimes, and it, it messes up our lives. He is taking that upon himself. Why is that a big deal? Because for you and I to carry that ourselves, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Wow. My sin costs life. It's, it means my sin is death. And that's the price for sin, for you and for me. We sin, we die. But he goes on in that verse to say, but the gift of God is eternal life. And Jesus is that gift. Why is he the gift? Because he's going to pay the price for your sin and for mine. That's what this day is all about. That's what this season is all about. That's what our Savior is all about. He's paying the price for death, for sin, I'm sorry, which is death. Whoa. In order for him to do that, he takes on the sin of the world. He carries that burden. 
and there's a pressure and a pressing and a, there is something going on that mere man cannot handle. And I believe that the Spirit of God helped him through this time to endure it. That's just my opinion. But this is what he's going through in the garden. How bad was it? Well, if you look uh, at the scripture, it tells us the pressure was so great, the squeezing like of the olive was so great that out of him came sweat in the form of blood. The blood began to, began to pour from him. Just like if you and I were sweating, it would be blood. Why is that significant? Because in Hebrews, it tells us that there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. Without There is no remission of sin without shedding of blood. Blood must be shed. And why it goes back to the Old Testament where that was a purifying thing spiritually in the Jewish faith. What is it for us? Same thing. It is the blood of Jesus that covers our sin. It covers our stain. It's what sets us free. God takes our sin and he removes it, the Bible says, as far as, as the east is from the west. And he remembers it against us no more because God can do that. What a gift. Do you receive that gift? Have you ever thought about it? Have you ever thought of the, the cost or the price for you to carry your own sin? Can you picture yourself standing at the judgment alone, like he was alone in the garden, you being alone before God with sin? And the same penalty goes to you that went on Christ if you're apart from Christ. However, if you're in Christ, he's taken that penalty from you and you're made righteous because of what he has done. Have you accepted that free gift? Think about that. And then it goes on. And it shows you how great this pressure was. And he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Pressure is so great. And what he is doing at this time is he's taking on the sin of the world, but he's also drinking from the cup of the wrath of God. And that is unbearable. And he does not want to drink from the cup. He does not want to be separated in any way from the Father. This is... This is this is the sacrifice. This is the greatest part of the whole crucifixion story is what's happening to him in the garden by taking on the burden of sin. So much so that oh, if there could be another way, let there be. But then he says, not my will, but yours be done. Oh, wow. Can we come to that place? Can we come to the place? Next thing that happens, we have he comes to Jerusalem with Palm Sunday and the celebration of Hosanna. After the celebration of Hosanna, he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he begins to pour his blood by the pressure of carrying the weight of sin of the world past, present, and future. And then the, the sour cherry, the bitter sour cherry on the top of this punishment at this time on this night was that he sees his betrayer handing him over to the authorities, the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, and to the Roman law. Hands him over for them to do with him what they will. And in verse um, 45, it says, as soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him, this is Judas, and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then he laid their hands, they laid their hands on him and took him. Not like, oh, Jesus, heal him. Like laid hands on him, like grabbed him and yanked him off. And we'll talk about this on Friday. And we'll talk about what this crucifixion process really was. We'll do that then. And the question I have for you today is the one I asked just a few moments ago. Where do you stand with this Jesus? Are you a hallelujah, hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord, knowing only the shallow things of God? Are you the one that rides the, the emotional wave? Or are you the one that he's praying about in John 17, where he desires to be so intimate and so close to you and you with the Father and you with each other? Are you in that group? That is the group that gets saved. And I guess my word to you is think about it. Process it. What does that mean for you? Are you a betrayer? 
you followed him at one time. And now you have left him, just like Judas. Who are you like? Evaluate yourself. Take a deep look. I'll tell you what, God has given us time. He has our attention. Uh, this circumstances in our world, we, he has our attention. And we have plenty of time. Now look to the deeper things. Where do you stand with Christ? My prayer is that you would receive the fullness of that gift that he gives. I pray that in Jesus' name. So Heavenly Father, let each person sitting at home in front of their computers, their TVs, or whatever, their phones, Father, let them take a moment to pause, to realize what you have done for them, and let them make decisions based on this. I pray in Jesus' name. I pray that they open their hearts to receive the fullness of who you are. They turn their sin over to you. Father, I pray for that in Jesus' name. And they say, Lord, we will follow you. You be our Lord. You be our King. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.